Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing a new series on Abzu, a very beautiful but short game that it features a lot of really interesting species of marine life and freshwater life forms that we're going to do a deep dive of. So I'm thinking to set this apart and make this a little bit longer, we're going to go through every species we can and talk about different aspects of their biology and such. That's why we're calling it an Anzu Deep Dive, so we can have a look at all the cool species and learn something about all the marine life that's in this game. So we're here we're just going to start off at the beginning, like all good stories, and we hopefully you guys enjoy and... Hopefully we all learn something. I've definitely learned something researching for this video. I even got my references right here so I can make sure that we're all set and ready to learn. Okay, let's go. Spooky, ain't it? Oh. Ooh. Oh no, look at us. Oh, we awaken. We are a robot. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? Straight tropical. Hold this one. So look at that. We've got the tutorial sorted. You see the beautiful waters with the shoals of fish. It's just very beautiful aesthetically. Have a look. We'll get more into the fishes when we are able to uh, have a look at them through the meditation view. So a lot of these you'll see, we can see some all sorts of different species of fish, so we press the boost. Yeah, we're going hard. So we see, ooh, ooh. See lots of different starfish and such. And here we have our first species. This is basing on this kind of themed area, which is supposed to be like the kelp forests around like uh, California, and like places like New Zealand and such. Oh, we've got a cobra coming up. I'll finish that thought when we're finished. So if we press shift, we get to ride this Goliath grouper. Now, doing my research, this looks like it's in... Even though it says Goliath grouper, it's supposed to be a Atlantic giant grouper, considering where most of these species come from in the habitats. And there's a lot very interesting... Speaking about Goliath gropers, there's a very big fish that is known to live around the Caribbean and the Bahamas and such, and the Florida Keys, but at about depths between 5 to 50 meters. And also known from, occasionally found on the east coast of like Massachusetts and New England, and even in the Congo living in like brackish water environments not very deep water but living close and outside the uh, just slightly off the coast and got very big like these individuals got about like uh, two and a half meters long about eight feet and even got up to like 360 kilos the largest specimen was but even though they usually average about 180 kilos And they're very common for fishermen to try and catch, so that's always a very prized fish, it's like a game fish. And they're very, uh, even though they're uh, vulnerable, they are protected, there's laws to protect from uh, populations and such. And there was a ban around, what was the ban? It 
it was just like band and now they're starting to get back to their post band kind of populations and sizes so they're getting quite big again and they are basically just like the garbage trucks of the ocean they'll eat pretty much crustaceans octopuses young sea turtles even and sharks and barracudas and are just have been known to attack um and have been known to attack divers but clearly these ones are very nice and even sharks large lemon sharks have been known to attack and what's weird is that they're also called jewfish because they believe the meat is kosher or could have it's the entomology is a bit weird so it could be like a, either kosher which is believed to be clean in a lot of religions or might have just been jawfish wrong have a quick look around here. I think we'll find a meditation point. There we are. There's one right there. You can see here there's a very nice meditation point. So we'll go around and have a look at all the different species that we have here. Let's enter the meditation. So here we've got a black sea bass. Let me just find my reference for this one. Very easy. So Black Sea Bass is a marine grouper that's found a lot in Maine and Florida and the Gulf of Mexico, that's where they're often found. And all right across the United States, both coasts. And they're found in waters that are about like inshore, that are up to about 130 meters deep, and uh, like to congregate around formations such as like man-made reefs and lots of rocks and wrecks and a lot of, they like to find little crevices to hide in going around having a feed. So, and one thing that's really interesting about a couple of these fish here is that they're protogynous hermaphrodites which means they uh, basically first mature as females and then as they get older and bigger they turn back into they turn into males and can and they're not very big they call the biggest one found is about four or five kilos so not huge fish but very interesting nonetheless so here we've got a female California sheephead, you can see the smaller one here, Oops, let's go back, there's the male here, the males are quite big and they have the same kind of thing, they also protogenous hermaphrodites, the males are these big ones here with the uh, black heads and red bodies, very interesting, let me just find my reference for them, very interesting fish, and they get about a little over one and a half feet long, or about half, half a meter or so for these big males. And they can live up to 21 years, believe it or not. That's basically the oldest ones. And they also, they are very, they like to swim around in kelp forests like here. And they feed on sea urchins and like hard shelled food. That's called durophagy, where they eat hard, short, hard food. Still there, then we have the male sheep that we still hit with them. And being a ras, the it's a very extreme difference between the male and female, especially as they grow up, so you can see the huge difference. We can see if we can find the female. The females are the smaller ones that you see swimming with them that are just red, so you can see how much bulkier and how different the males and females look to each other. And these guys are found all across like the states as well. A lot of these creatures do come from the United States just because there's a lot of a lot of the kelp forests around there is where they have a lot of these species. It's very interesting to see. And I think that's enough for these beautiful California sheepheads. So we've got the male, the female ones are these, as I said, are the red ones. Let's see what else we can find. Here we have a uh, kelp fish. Let me just find my reference for the kelp fish. We have large kelp fish. Even though it says kelp fish, there's a particular species uh, called a large kelp fish. That's actually found in southern Australia and the North Island of New Zealand, actually quite near to me. And they're about depths about 30 meters and they get about 40 centimeters long. And the Maori name for the large kelp fish is the Huahiro. 
Hero Hero or something like that. It's very difficult to pronounce, but there's not much to really be said about the species. It's just a fish that likes to live in these kelp forests. And she looks like a bottom dweller, but here they seem someone around. We got a, another male. See if we can compare him to a female. There's another male. Here we go, we can see a female here. The females are not quite as interesting in that color. Oh. We'll go back to meditating. We'll see a look at other species we can find. We can see here female. Here we got anchovies. Very interesting. There's a lot of different species. I think there's 140 different species of anchovies, so I wasn't really able to really look at all the different ones and figure out which species this was but a lot of them are found they're found all across the world and even some in South America even live in freshwater and they're quite a common uh, fish for eating and especially like uh, a, f a lot of like salmon and shark and Chinook salmon and pelicans even eat them they're a very they're at the bottom of the food chain and are very important for maintaining these kind of ecosystems. And they are little filter feeders, which means they open their mouths as they swim, trying to collect all the plankton and zooplankton that they can. Very interesting little fish. Very important for as these ecosystems, as I said, because they make the foundation and protecting them. Oh, that was another live gropo. See? That even just proves my point. They just very important for these ecosystems. It all goes up the food chain. And they've got to be very careful to protect anchovy populations since they're so important. And now we have a look at the groper. I've already mentioned what I said about the groper. So I think we'll move on to whatever else we can find. It's a female sheep. Let's see if we can get a yellow tang. I can see some lobsters down there. Don't know what particular species that is. I can't really think of one. Another black sea bass. Kelpfish. Oh, we got a leopard shark. Who doesn't love a leopard shark? Now, leopard sharks are a kind of hound shark that are found around the Pacific coast and Oregon and Mexico, a lot of those areas. And uh, very common near the coast in water less than four meters deep. And they're very active predators living in like mud flats and such, looking for clams, worms, shrimp, fish eggs, all sorts of whatever they can find. They're very opportunistic. And they usually stay in one area and then they'll take long movements somewhere. Oh, geez. You look, he's going ham. And they usually breed around. They, they have an aplacental viparous. So they're aplacental viparous. Oh, there's a yellow tang. I think we'll move on. We'll find him at the shark again and then we'll carry on with the tank. Where is the shark? The problem is that they all get eaten by stuff and it's hard to keep the focus. I think we'll manage it though. There we are, this back to leopard shark. So that means the babies are still inside their mother, but they don't have like a proper placenta, they still have a, like a yolk. They're just like a shellless egg inside the mother. Like a lot of sharks, it's similar to even things like Greg White have a similar system. And a lot of these, same problem with a lot of these species that they tend to be overfished, especially for things like shark fin soup, which is very wasteful and kills about 500 million sharks a year. Let's see what else. They get to about two and a half, uh, two and a half, one and a half meters long. They're not very huge sharks. Oops. We're moving over to another one here. And they get these. They're named the leopard shark from this lip and like pattern that they have on their bodies with the spots, which does very much look does look like a leopard. And they can form large schools, but they're segregated by age or sex. And they sometimes intermingle with uh, species like brown smoothhead and spiky dogfish, which are very nomadic, and they like to just swim around do their own thing. And I think that's about it. What if we can say on. Uh, leopard sharks so let's see what else we can move on to I want to find a yellow tank so we can carry on is that a it's a female another female so yellow tank here yeah. let's see what we can get another black 
not see this. Oops. Very interesting little fish. Quite a common in the pet trade. Oh, they nearly got eaten too. They got eaten. Oh no. I'll just carry on about yellow tang when we can. I don't want to get quite fish just yet. There we are, we got a yellow tang. Hopefully it doesn't get eaten. They're quite common in the pet trade. Quite a common, quite easy to keep saltwater aquarium fish. They'd only get about 27, 20 centimeters long, so not a particularly huge fish, which is good. With the males getting older and also have this bright yellow color, which gives them their name, yellow tang. They eat, they often, they are herbivores, so they like to feed on marine plants, even though in captivity they, ju they just fed like normal fish food and they take to that quite well and they're found all across the Pacific Ocean at depths between 2 and 46 centimeters uh, not centimeters, uh, meters of course that's not very deep and they have been actually recorded around Florida believe it or not which is weird because they're not native there they might have been introduced by the pet trade Trumpet fish, very interesting. Oh, and that works perfectly. Okay, trumpet fish. The species I couldn't find, but I'll use example. The trumpet fish is just a good basic example. Chinese trumpet fish just have these very weird long bodies, and uh, they, there's, a, there's like a bunch of different species that come in a bunch of different colors. I believe this one is definitely a Chinese trumpeter because they get this color, and obviously found around China as it says in the name and sometimes they have different spots see they're found around the Indian and Pacific Ocean at depths up to 120 meters and they're believe it or not they're solitary which they live in oh that's another leopard shark still in my kelp my kelp fish Let's see if I can use my trumpet fish I don't want my groper I want my trumpet fish And they tend to actually follow around, uh, they like to ambush prey and they like to hang out in like wood, well not wood, but hard corals and different areas that they can climb into and then attack prey and even follow around like sea turtles so they, when they have the opportunity, they can take some of the scraps of their prey or even just take things off them. Even other big fishes like these gropers that we have here, that's another good example of species that they like to live with and try and steal scraps from and even feed sometimes on small fishes and crustaceans but they tend to like looking for prey in these look like those areas that I described and next we'll move on to the next one we see here we've already got a leopard shark we've got a hawksbill sea turtle which is probably one of the most interesting ones in this area which is, believe it or not is critically endangered sadly and it's related to like the green sea turtle and such, which we'll see later on. And are found across the Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific Oceans, which is a pretty huge area. And they got their name because of their hawk-like uh, beak. 
which is kind of self-descriptive, but they get about a metre long and weigh about 80 kilos, though the largest one found was 127 kilos. And they've got a very interesting pattern on their backs, see if we move back to the great uh, books book. got it stuck on the groupers. I think the system that you used to pick species are going to have another hawk's bill. So they're quite famous for having that kind of beak that makes it look like a hawk. They even have some claws on their flippers which I don't, which I don't think they've showed off in this model. See so they found around coral reefs and like ledges where they rest during the day and they're very highly migratory so they move around all across the world in the in the areas that they found so we might find individuals in different areas just because they're very migratory and they'll eat like a lot of sea sponges and often eat things like jellyfish algae and all sorts of interesting things see one there I want to move to there we are even like, they'll even manage to eat uh, Portuguese man of war, which is a very venomous type of siphonophore. And, but along with most turtles, they tend to come up on the land to lay their eggs, and then they'll just dump them and go, and thousands will rush to the beach, and only like one in a thousand will survive, just because that's their strategy of breeding. So, just throw as many as you can at predators, and then once, and hopefully a few survive, which it's a very efficient strategy for them, by the looks of it. And sadly, they're quite poached a lot, along with other species. I don't want to keep. I don't want to talk about the groupies now. Back to you. Sadly, they're poached a lot just because. They are, and they're a delicacy in China as well. A lot, a lot of, like a lot of other things on this list, like shark fin soup and stuff. So we said, but now that they're protected at least, so their numbers are going up, even though they're still critically endangered. So now they're all protected and getting the protection that they need to live a long life that they are clearly able to do, because most turtles live a very long lives. I think we'll move, we'll see what else we can find here. I think we'll move on to this grouper. Let's see if we can have a look at those yellow tangs. Have a look at this. We have the five lines snapper, which is not too different from any other snapper. That is found around the native to the Indian Ocean and found in the Western Pacific as well. Known to inhabit coral reefs that are found about between 2 and 40 meters deep, so not very deep species. And often get about, the largest ones are about 38 centimeters long, which is about 15 inches or so. And usually do not get more than 30 though, they don't get more than 12 inches. And uh, a very important game fish and are often found a lot in the pet trade. So. Unlike most other snapper, they just eat what snapper eat a little small fish and such. So they're not too too different from other snapper. It's mainly just a different species. We'll see what else we can find. There's another cool fish coming up this way. I'm trying to find the galadi. Here we are, a galbaradi. Gel varieties are a species of damselfish that are found around the Pacific Ocean, so like areas like here. The common name comes from the Italian military and political figure Giuseppe Garbaldi, which obviously I'm butchering the heck out of that, who often wore red shirts and such, that's how they got their name. And male, these males of these species are very aggressive in defending their nests. And they often get to about 38 centimeters long, and the babies, which we don't see here, often have like iridescent red spots, which is really cool to see. 
and they often feed on things, small things like invertebrates where they get from rocks and they maintain like a home territory and their eggs take about 90 to 21, 19 to 21 days to hatch and you can actually see inside the eggs the baby's developing and it's quite cute and their parents obviously are very territorial about it and defend them so overall this is a very nice species of fish too see here as we the last species I think we've got around here is the uh, we're looking for a seahorse which I believe is meant to be a lacto uh, it's not around here we're gonna have to move oh, see if we can find a seahorse that we can get a look at there we are might just not meditate and go and have a look at it for ourselves. So I think we'll go have a look at our seahorses. We'll just move our way down here. I see one right there actually. We can see here the seahorse. So this is basically called the uh, Hippocampus Cuda or is also known as the common seahorse or the yellow seahorse. It's got a very few very, uh, quite a couple uh, species names and are quite famous for holding on to kelp with their tails since they're not very good swimmers. These are found basically all across the world from the Persian Gulf to Hawaii to South, Asia, uh, South Africa and even been recorded in the Red Sea. And they live in like these uh, sheltered coastal waters and pretty much everywhere they can in seaweed. They like to live in between 8 meters deep in the sea to about 55 and they are carnivorous. They feed on small crustaceans and plankton and such though they are... and they're also opoviparous which means the male brood... and it's the male that broods the eggs so like the it's quite famous to see, like the female will lay the eggs in a pouch that the male has and then when the babies are old enough they'll come up the pouch and be born. Which is very interesting because obvious, obviously not a lot of males will do that. So a lot of them, are, even though they're still caught, they're vulnerable because they believe their populations might be decimated by things like bycatch and just like thrown and discarded so it's very it's very damaging to the environment that these guys live in and often are caught in these nets and discarded just because they're not what the fishermen are looking for which is a bit sad but that's that's how it is hopefully there's should be more rules in place to help save the ocean that's very like reducing bycatch using more higher quality nets and such like a lot of these, a lot of species are affected by overfishing and bycatch and such. It's just a very prevalent problem in the oceans today, which sucks. But yeah, I think with this is actually we've done everything in this area. So now we get to move on to carry on with the story. Actually, we we'll see some different species of uh, starfish, which are scavengers. They like to hang around at the bottom and just pick up whatever food they had, along with sea urchins also eats crustaceans and such. Look at this beautiful thing. Oh, what are you scanning me for? So now we'll move on to the next one. Cutting us up. Oh, 
so the shock, that's dangerous, ain't it? Now here we see a bunch of really cool eels. These are green morays, I'm pretty sure. Yep, green morays. They get up to about a two and a half meters long. They swim using this undulating pattern that they see here. It's not very often you see them out swimming in the open like this. They're like, like most eels, they like to hide in cracks and such in the rocks and they're very much ambush predators and then jump out and grab their prey. But they also, also have a second set of jaws that they use to, when they bite, they have the jaws in the middle of the snout that they can like push out to grab prey and then keep it stable as they drag it into their mouths. So it's kind of, since a lot of the fish and stuff they're eating is very slippery. So it's a very interesting adaptation that even animals like mosasaurs that have convergently evolved to have the same kind of thing even though they don't move. It's just to help catch prey and it's very efficient. See us chilling. See this is a very beautiful game I think. It's very relaxing. We're just chilling. We're just vibing. Oh. Look at this. It's all gross. See, this is what the oceans might look like if we don't take proper care of it. So now we're moving on to this green light. Looks lit. So now we see. And we're diving in. series. Boost it. Look at that beautiful water and look what's coming out of the water. Ooh. Wow, look at those beautiful rays. I'm gonna have to have a good look at them. I think we'll grab onto one and just swim with it. Just hang on while we're playing along and just watch them. Let's grab ourselves a nice manta ray. Hopefully they'll be friendly for us. Should be friendly. Obviously you shouldn't go around and try grabbing wild animals, so don't try this at home folks. If you live right next to the sea with a lot of giant green life, please do not go and grab your own giant manta ray or any other type of fish without Hang on, look at that. Wow, look how huge that manta ray is. Now, this species of manta ray, which has recently been described, it's always been known, but it's just re-evaluating the genetics. It's come up, it's its own type of, own species of these giant oceanic manta rays, which roam across the oceans around the world. So the largest ones that we know of got about seven meters wide and about up to three tons, though they averagely only get around four and a half meters long. And they have very smooth skin and are filter feeders 
so they like to sift through their gi uh, gills, plankton and such. A lot of these really big fish tend to be uh, planktonic feeders. They just sift through with their giant gills and just sift what food they have. And they have a very huge range. They can be found from California to New Zealand to Egypt to the Azores. They are a lot of these very big ocean species have very huge wide ranges that they can go as far as they like through the ocean. And they're not very common in aquarium, but there are a few aquariums like the George Aquarium and the Resorts World Sinita in Singapore that house and have actually the George Aquarium has like managed to breed manta rays like these in captivity. And what they do is they like to swim there's a lot of species that like to travel them as they swim, like seabirds and marine mammals and a lot of fish like remoras, which kind of just hang off them and kind of like an island in an oasis of the sea. And one thing they also like to do is, there's a lot of cleaner fish like a rat, cleaner wrasse that they will often go into spots and reefs where the, a lot of these fish will hang out and clean off all the parasites on their skin, which is really, which is really cool to see how they benefit because the wrasse obviously gets a nice meal and the manta ray gets clear of parasites. We need to catch back up to you again. Believe it or not they don't have many predators though. They usually only uh, may be preyed upon by like tiger sharks or killer whales or false killer whales are really capable of pre preying on them but once they reach a good enough size they're usually pretty safe from most things. And even though the population has over the past 20 years has been rapidly decreasing sadly just because of of course bycatch and just being fish and being so large often these animals have low fecundity rates or tend to be very slow breeding. Some of the elephants like they have a very long gestation period and only have like one pup or even just not breed very often and very late they mature sexually very late in life so it often takes a long time for their numbers to rebound back when their numbers have been knocked down like a lot of other big long-lived species which is very sad to see but they have been trying to bring the numbers back they're also there what's also sad is that on the Chinese market their gill rakers have been their prices have gone up and that's increased fishing for these uh, endangered species which well not endangered but they're vulnerable but these species in potential danger which is always very sad to see no one wants to see these gigantic beautiful creatures go extinct so now i think now we've moved on from manta rays we're going to move to the meditation area wherever that is There is. It's often hard to find yourself. Look at all these fish. Ooh, sitting down, chilling. Now let's see what we've got. We've got the giant Trevelli. which are very large fish even often commonly found in a I'm actually drawing a bit of a blank here let me just grab my reference yeah they're found a lot of tropical areas like South Africa Hawaii, Japan even some being found in the Galapagos even though they're not very common there they get to about 170 centimeters long or 1.7 meters, not quite 2 meters, and get up to 80 kilos, so it's basically as big as a person. So they're quite an interesting species found in like estuaries and 
as they are younger, they tend to live in lagoons, and then as they get older, they move off to atolls and deeper areas when they get uh, older. And they're actually an apex predator, which means they often eat, uh, basically eat, and they even hunt in shoals too, so they're able to basically eat whatever they like. They've seen sunny seabirds and smaller fish that they like to feed on, even other crustaceans and mollusks that they like. And even stuff like squids and cuttlefish, they do like to eat. And they also, like other species, they often swim around and try and follow like monk seals and sharks to help ambush prey and just try and kind of rebound feed of some of the work that the other species is doing, which is a symbiotic relationship. And they tend to reproduce during the warm months. So they often spawn with the lunar cycle, like a lot of other fish, where they'll often go in large shoals and, sport and spawn in bays and such. And when they, they get about sexually mature when they are about 60 centimeters long or so, so about a third full, full age. Some more giant genetic everywhere. They're quite common in terms of uh, fishing and often taken in nets and by lures and there's a bit like 10,000 tons often you get of calls of these giant trevally and that's taken out every year so every year you take about 10,000 tons of trevally is taken out of the ocean every year which is causing their populations to of course decrease even though they actually are doing okay in a lot of areas just needs to be more protections in place to make sure these species don't go extinct or don't get overfished, which is a very big problem with the ocean. There's another giant trout in the not just at those. So the fish we can get. Oh, we got the unicorn fish. Another very interesting fish. Here we have, I believe these guys are the white margin unicorn fish, which are found around the Indo Pacific Ocean. So basically the Indian and Pacific Ocean and is one of the largest members of its group so they get about a hundred centimeters long or about a meter and they're very well known for having these very large protuberances coming out of their face which obviously makes them look like a unicorn which gets their name the unicorn fish and they're often found in large schools around tropical reefs and feed on things like zooplankton and uh, like small filter feeders and generally are a very interesting fish that occasionally seen in aquariums which I haven't really seen though so I think we'll move on to another fish now oh that's perfect timing we get to have a look at the rooster fish now the rooster fish is a very common gay fish found around California and Peru and it's got its name because of those very tall spines on its back here that make it look like the comb of a rooster and they often get pretty huge they can get up to about 1.6 meters and over 50 kilograms believe it or not that the average weight, uh, weight for one is about 10 kilos and are a very common game fish but are not very good for eating so a lot of people just catch them and put them back a lot of these big predator fish tend to be not very good eating so we'll get so it's very nice to see this fish represented so I think we'll move on to another one if we can and we'll see what else we can find. There's another rooster fish. Let's see if we can move on to something else. We're just getting a lot of giant trevally at the mo. Fish, we get this is a threadfin butterfly fish. Let's see if we can find very beautiful species. They are found in the Red Sea. Well, obviously found like a lot of these species around the Indian and Pacific Ocean. Believe it or not, found from Eastern Africa to Hawaii and even Lord Howe in southern Japan. And they get up to about 23 centimeters long or 9 inches. And they have these patterns on them. So yeah, they've got the eye spot which is used to distract predators and very interesting intricate patterns which makes them very beautiful looking fish, often found in like a courier. It's 
obviously very epic. And there's actually not too much known about all these fish. And there's, there's, it's a huge group of butterfly fish and they feed on like sewer plankton and such. And they make very often found in aquariums of course and often feed on sea anemones and coral polyps so you've got to be very careful with uh, lost it but that's okay you gotta be very careful with housing them with uh, reefs like reef tanks because they'll eat often the corals so you gotta be careful with that Let's see what else we can find keep the pilot fish for the next episode let's see what else we can See if we can get a. I want to see if we can get a yellow fin. It's on the rooster fish. Yellow fin snapper. I think it's called. I'm making 100% sure. Oh yeah, I think we got one. Oh, that's a pilot fish. Game doesn't like me looking at the snappers. Here we are, yellow tail snapper. So I think I was incorrect quite with the name. So these are actually another quite very abundant species of snapper found in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. And they tend to live from near the surface to around 180 meters deep in the wild and found a lot in coral reefs but also occur in habitats like this so this is quite fitting for them they can get to about 86 centimeters long but they often don't exceed uh, 40 centimeters so they're off these are just very extremely big individuals the biggest one they found was about 4.1 kilos and is often quite farmed it's a very common recreational fish it's often seen in aquariums and fish farms and around the Florida Keys. So that's I mean, yeah, that's about it that we can say on the uh, yellowfin. So I think we're done here, unless there's any other species that we can see, which I don't. So I'll quickly sit there for a bit. to the next area, the final area. We'll have a look at some very interesting species on our way. Let's just take a moment to see all these beautiful fish. Tell me that's not the most beautiful. I like all the colors, I like the vibrancy of this game. Even though it's not 100% like realistic, you can really see the attention to detail with all the different species. They really did a good job with trying to show off all these beautiful species. That make our ocean their home. see in front of us here we've got a moon jellyfish which are a very common species of jellyfish often found around harbors and such and get about 40 centimeters in diameter and feed a lot on mollusks plankton and choose the, the tentacles that they use where they drift in the current and they're actually a very common prey species for an animal that we're going to be meeting very soon. So we're just going to move our way through here. No 
we're moving back out. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no, the shark got us. So now we're gonna... Now we're gonna move on to a dangerous place to the dark depths of the ocean. I can see why a lot of people get scared of the depths of the ocean, just because it's... There's nothing, it's just... It's dark, and we just see darkness. And we see a couple new species. See what we can spot down in the bottom. Try and hide the surprise. So there's a lot of crayfish at the bottom, and lobsters. Which are quite common food. That live in crevices and hide wherever they can in the world, of course. Oh look, we see here some horseshoe crabs as well. Horseshoe well, crabs, believe it or not, are act actually true crabs. They're actually uh, are arthropods. So more closely related to things like spiders than true crabs. And are pretty much living fossils. Believed to be like... They've pretty much not changed in 100 to 450 million years. So we often find these in the fossil record, which is really interesting to see how much they've survived unchanged. They just found the perfect body plan and just managed to stick with it. What else we can find down in these dark depths? Nothing around here. Let's see if we can find anything else. Some lantern fish, we'll cover that in the future. I don't think we're gonna find anything around here. I'll see if we can find, look at that, we've got the leatherback sea turtle. Which is the largest living species of turtle. Believe it or not. Look at that, isn't it? A beauty. So they're found around all across the world. They're very migratory species. And they can get up to two meters long, which is huge. And they can. 2.7 meters long, even bigger than that, so about like nine feet long. And they often get up to half a ton, which is a huge, 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 huge. And what's really awesome about them is that they're also very deep divers too, so they like to dive down the deep of the ocean and they feed on things like jellyfish. They're very specialized in eating jellyfish, even in their mouths. If you look inside the mouth of a leatherback sea turtle, they've got it almost looks like it's got spikes all over it. So the esophagus, because it, it traps soft sh uh, soft jellyfish in there, so they can't slip out of their throats and make sure they're trapped in their stomachs. And they actually are a thing called mesothermic, which allows them to swim out into colder waters than other turtles, because they're so large, they're able to better retain body heat, so they can also uh, that's why it allows them to survive in these areas where jellyfish are more plentiful and as I said they're found pretty much all around the world by the extreme arctic they're found from New Zealand to Alaska pretty much they're just not found in extremely tropical waters or extremely deep waters living in the open ocean they like to they basically dive eat, deeper than pretty much either other animals except like sperm whales and beaked whales so they yeah so they don't just eat jellyfish but they eat a lot of other soft shelled species and um, soft species like obviously cephalopods and such they just that's what they specialize in eating who's going hard swimming around and loving life and no one knows how long they live though they're so elusive we have no idea they can get up to these to be some say 30 years or more but some could even say 100 years it's just we have no idea and unlike like other turtles they often they climb on land and lay eggs and such and then their babies are eaten by like coatis monitor lizards skulls whatever's on the beach to eat them and then when they as they get older they're often eaten by killer whales and great white sharks and tiger sharks sadly and even there was a jaguars that specifically go out and hunt them as they're climbing on the land to eat their eat them as they're laying the eggs which is a little bit sad of course
And they're also there's a they have a big problem with uh, boats as as they swim behind a boat it can often really badly chop them up so a lot of specimens that we do find of them often just get so cut up just because they're not able to just survive from these bad cuts from fish uh, ships so that's terrible to think that what's happened to them so okay I think what we're gonna do now is quickly grab that collectible and then make our way to finish this video because we're on only on the first chapter now See if we can get the achievement. So now we're going to move over. This is going to be the end of this video because this is the end of chapter one. Once we get to the, we see some other fish here that we'll see around in a later date. Looks like some wahoo there. I won't give you any information yet. That's for another video. Are we even going the right way? No, we aren't. Not necessarily. Now we can't even go back the way we came. So like, nah, we don't like you anymore. So now we're moving on to the next chapter, which I'll leave here. So this is where we'll move on in the next episode. So hopefully you guys like and subscribe, and bye-bye.